Everybody loves a great triumph, overcoming an obstacle so large that nobody expected you to complete it. In sports, there's hardly ever a greater feeling than that, right? Now imagine a sporting event so grand, it still hasn't been topped, even over a hundred years later. This is what you don't know about the New York to Paris race of 1908. you don't know about sports, where we delve into the forgotten stories, teams, and athletes of sports history, and question widely held takes on today's sports. I'm Blake, and this is Matt. Howdy. Today we're going to tell you about the story of the longest motorsport event ever to take place still to this day. No racing event, allegedly, officially, unofficially, has ever lasted longer and that is the automobile race from New York to Paris that took place in 1908. If y'all have got a longer one, I'd love to hear about it. But anyway, Matt, what is your most memorable motorsport event or single moment of a from a motorsport event? Uh, that's it's a hard question for me to answer because it is – for me, one of my favorite sports in general, motorsports in general, obviously from where I am, uh, NASCAR uh, is the prevailing motorsport. Uh, I've got, I'm going to go with a, a, a bookmark, kind of a, a sandwich situation. I think uh, for me and for a lot of people, uh, there are two Daytona 500 moments that are bookends of a, uh, just a kind of a piece of NASCAR history. One would be, in 1998, when Dale Earnhardt wins the Daytona 500, and then one would be in 2001 when Dale Earnhardt dies in the Daytona 500. Uh, that was not the peak of NASCAR's popularity, but it was, uh, even if you look at the numbers, it was sort of the the highest trajectory it would ever be on was between those uh, the, those events. Uh, and they were memorable and they were memorable, not just for people watching it and fans of the the sport. They were memorable kind of internationally as well. They just kind of were big sports moments. And, I, and a lot of times NASCAR and motorsports in general doesn't transcend that way. So for me, um, those would be two kind of larger than life things. One for obvious reasons. One, because it was the biggest star winning the biggest race for the first time. Uh, and it kind of looked like he wasn't going to for a while. So. Yeah, yeah. If I had to put one over all the rest, it would probably be the 2001 Daytona 500. Um, if I had to do like the most, my most, like a more um, happy, happy motorsport event moment, it would probably be uh, just a few months after that incident when uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. won what would would what was the Pepsi 400. At Daytona in July, Michael Walter basically pushed him across the finish line to win um, just a few months after his father died on the track. That was, uh, I watched that video recently. I, I just told y'all like, like a 10 second brief of what just happened and I got chills. Like that's what, that's what that oh, moment yeah. still does. I watched that video on uh, Twitter. Dale Jr. probably retweeted it and that's where I saw it. <laughs> but um, that, that clip of him, like the last couple laps of that race and just them celebrating afterwards and the emotion that had to had to be just flowing through everybody at that moment because of the significance of it. But I would probably say uh, I'd probably say the same. The 2001, just because of its uh, just because of its historical relevance and like what it meant to everybody, what it meant to the sport at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I think I mean, I know for me, I, mean, I have plenty of personal moments going to races uh, or watching them with with family and stuff like that but um but i think yeah from a historic standpoint those would be some that stand out for it's sure ridiculous there's a, and there's a lot of motorsporting history out there one in particular being this race that lasted almost half of a year uh it started in america ended in france 
We're going to tell you about it. Before we tell you about that, though, a year before this race, in 1908, a race took place in 1907. And it started in China, what is now Beijing, and ended in Paris. Uh, if you if you listen to the Tour de France episode, you'll know that the Tour de France started uh, basically by a written publication wanting to advertise itself, and it held a bicycle race, and it is now the most popular bicycle race in the world called the Tour de France. Well, a French newspaper in 1907 wrote a challenge basically to anyone who wanted to enter to compete in this race. Uh, it was an automobile magazine, basically to compete in a race. Uh, as far as they could imagine at the time, I assume, ending in Paris, they went as far away as they possibly could to China. And they set out a challenge for anyone who wanted to try and conquer this race. And this newspaper article wrote, and I quote, what needs to be proved today is that as long as a man has a car, he can do anything and go anywhere. Is there anyone who will undertake to travel this summer from Paris to Peking by automobile? So the challenge was put out there to the public and uh, five teams took part in this race and an Italian car actually won. Uh, not, so not a Chinese car or a, uh, or a French car, but uh, an Italian car won the race. Well, that was such a success that the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune, because Americans can't just let people have their own things, you know, we always have to, we always have to join the party somehow and, it, well, you know. You we know, are bad. Uh, okay, okay, my bad. And so <laughs> the New York Times, <laughs> the New York Times and Chicago Tribune ended up joining this party uh, with the French newspaper Le Matin, and hosted a bigger and bolder challenge. This time, the drivers would begin the race in New York City, travel all the way across the United States to San Francisco, which had not been done by car to this point in history. They would then drive north from San Francisco to Alaska. They would cross the Bering Strait by ship, then drive to Paris from Russia, which, I mean, how, how complicated would that be today? Much less on, on technology that's 114 years old. I mean, just, it, that's just crazy. That wouldn't, that's hardly, they tried it recently. They tried it about 10 years ago. Uh, and the first edition of them trying to retry this, uh, to recreate this thing, uh, like visas and stuff got in the way and they couldn't even, they couldn't even drive through one of the countries that they would have needed to drive through to recreate the race. So I can't imagine like with the technology and stuff, we'll get into the details, but like, this is a truly incredible challenge that they undertook. Yeah. I was, I was getting ready to say like the amazing race now doesn't go off without a hitch all the time. You see people have issues with the visas issues with um just like the travel in general weather problems flights get delayed obviously some of that stuff wouldn't be an issue here um in 1908 not all countries are going to have customs and you're getting stopped and and all that thing all that kind of stuff uh at every port of entry back then so that wouldn't have been necessarily the same issue but many of them did so you would have that same problem also, I'm, I'm just assuming you have the problem of there isn't roads everywhere. Yeah. I might be jumping ahead, but I'm just thinking no, that that's got to be a difficulty. You're absolutely correct. Most of America, most of the most of the race in America itself didn't wasn't on roads. Uh, and that's why it is partially why it took so long. Of course, they're driving yeah, cars built sure. in the early 1900s. And so they didn't have a top speed of 160 like like some cars today, but uh, they probably couldn't even go 60. And so like, that's part of the reason why it took so long, but yeah, we'll, probably we'll, couldn't even <laughs> probably couldn't even go 60 miles straight without having to fix something. Honestly. Uh, yeah. There, 60 I, an think, hour. I think there were a lot of mechanical issues, uh, but, but yeah, you're, you're definitely right. It was uh, the infrastructure wasn't there either. That that's going to play into it a good amount. So the 1908 edition included six teams. Three French teams, because why not? One from Germany, one from Italy, and one from the United States. Of course, you can't have two American newspapers sponsor this thing and then uh, stick our noses in it and then not compete, right? So We, we could have just done World War uh, One with a race instead of fighting. 
Oh, see? Could have knocked it out a little bit early. I mean... What are we doing here? I'm fine with that. Let's just settle everything, all all world trade talks and 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 conflicts with uh, with automobile races. Yeah. So in 1908, the race actually began in mid February. Remember, this is New York, mid February. Still it's still silly. cold. It's yeah. still cold. So it started actually in Times Square. About a quarter of a million people are reported to have lined the streets throughout New York City to watch these cars leave. It was supposed to start at 11 a.m. Well, uh, that didn't happen. So the mayor of New York at the time, uh, George B. McClellan Jr., who was the son of George B. McClellan, the Civil War Union general, it was the, the, the New York City mayor was supposed to start the race at 11 o'clock by gunfire. Well, he didn't show. And so a railroad tycoon who was there to spectate and be a part of the festivities, Colgate Hoyt, he allegedly grabbed the gun about 15 minutes after 11, fired it into the air, and off they went. So the mayor missed the start of the race, but 250,000 people did not. There were plenty of people to watch. It didn't take very long for the first car to abandon the race. Oh gosh! You were saying how how technology, of course, technology is weird, and cars are old, and they can't go very far without issues and all this stuff. Um, they didn't even make it out of New York State. One of the French teams broke a differential under their car and uh, had to abandon almost how immediately. Very, how very French! <laughs> <laughs> how French of them! Uh, so. Quickly, of the five teams that remained, three emerged as the favorites. They were always in the front, always leading. Uh, the De Dion team of Italy, the Zeust team, and the Thomas Flyer from America. Yeah. Thomas Flyer. You might, that might sound familiar to some history folks. That's a good name. Uh, the five teams, as they were traveling across New York, uh, they, were, they, were, they were encountering some snow issues. They they made a pact to work together, um, but that didn't last very long. Some began to rethink the this pact that they got into with their competitors. The deal was off almost immediately. It didn't take very long, but the agreement was for each team to alternate leadership of this race about every five hours, like take the lead and dig through uh, snowbanks and basically make the path for the cars behind them to go into, and they would alternate. Well, that didn't that didn't take very long. Like basically, any group project in school you ever did, mm. or any work project you've ever done, there's always people that are that back out and don't pull their weight and stuff. That basically happened here. So again, nothing is new. The Thomas Flyer began to build up a little bit of a lead. Uh, they are the only American team, uh, and and so obviously the locals who knew about this race. Wanted to help them win. And so the Americans had people volunteering for them, uh, giving them parts, giving them gas, fixing their car, giving them land to sleep on, allowing their car to drive through the people's lands without issue. Uh, The Italians didn't take to this American hostility very much because the Americans didn't like them. They actually charged uh, the Italian teams and the other teams. Uh, the locals did to use horses to pull their car out, to pull their cars out of snowbanks and for the teams to sleep on their land. And so they were having to pay these locals like in the middle of rural Indiana uh, <laughs> because all because they wanted the American team to win. Home is field that advantage. cheating? Home field is, advantage not cheating. Is that Home cheating? Field advantage. Is it not no. cheating? Cheating. Cheating is uh, the Tour de France having people go out and throw like uh, nails in the road or blockade in the, the course the to block <laughs> certain people from finishing. That's cheating. Yeah. This is just home field advantage. Like, give us some money. You're on my land. I didn't say you could be here. I don't care if there's a race. I, I don't even get the papers that said we were having a car race. I don't know nothing about it. All right, it's plausible deniability. So it's it's not cheating. It is home field advantage uh the race is going to finish in france the french people can do the same thing uh the italians can't but that's their fault they entered 
a race knowing good and well they were never going to set foot in their country <laughs> throughout the entire thing. So maybe <laughs> think that through. I don't know what to tell them. Maybe. So uh, a, a passenger, uh, one of the crewmates of the De Dion team, Hans Hendrik Hansen. Is that not one of the coolest names ever? Triple Hans H. Hendrik Hansen, Triple H. It's time to play the game. Time to play the game. He abandoned the Dadeon team and joined the Thomas Flyer team in Colorado. He wasn't getting along with them. Uh, the Dadeon car got caught in a snowdrift, and of course, Henson or Hansen, excuse me, not Henson. Hansen was tasked with getting the car out of the snowbank. He was having trouble doing that, and he and the driver of the car got into an argument. They almost challenged each other to a duel <laughs> in the middle of the Colorado winter uh, <laughs> uh, before the driver, Saint Chaffre, simply fired him, kicked him out of <laughs> kicked him off the <laughs> kicked him off the team. And uh he ended up joining the Thomas Flyer team as a crewmate. And so at hey, this man, point have, if have a conflict <laughs> with your teammates and then join join uh the leader, that sounds a lot join like the, uh, join Kevin the Americans. Hmm. He's trying to again. I th- I think secretly he wants to come back because he needs another ring. But anyway. Oh my goodness. So if you're All keeping right. track at home, this is the standings. These are the standings at this point. The uh the Thomas Flyer was well into Colorado. If 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 you like picture a map in your head, okay. Thomas Flyer was well into Colorado at this point. The Zeus was in Omaha, Nebraska. I don't know how somebody put this together, by the way. I just want to say very quickly that the journalism in this is uh, like any other very old historical journalism. It can be spotty at times. It can be missing information. Some of this could be passed down from generation to generation. And and we don't we can't truly know how true this is. But the information I'm telling you came from multiple sources uh, all aggregated together. And this this is our best guess as to what happened. But uh, so. All that to say, I don't know how the heck they figured out <laughs> at this moment in time where all these cars were, but it's very impressive, and I applaud their journalism. So uh, Thomas Flyers in Colorado, the Zeus in, uh, in Omaha, Nebraska, the Dadeon was in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, or the equivalent at the time. The Moto Blanc was in Maple Park, Illinois, and the Protos was in Geneva, Illinois. So the Moto Blanc and the Protos were very far back. Uh, the uh, the other three, the other three favorites that that uh, that showed up early in the race are well into the lead. One thing one thing I've noticed here is that so far uh, the race is is entirely within the Big Ten's new footprint. So that's great. Oh, th- they will remain in the Big Ten's new footprint for like the Forever. next month and a half of the race. <laughs> yeah, like, the maybe even there. when they get to Russia, they'll still be in the Big Ten footprint. Maybe because... that's what the Big Ten's like long con is. They just want to. Uh, they just want to have a new New York to Paris race. They're going to go international. They're taking over yeah. one city okay. at a time. Sorry, I have DJ Khaled. I'm sorry. Anyway, so when the Thomas Flyer gets to Wyoming, the driver of the Thomas Flyer, Montague Roberts, he left the race allegedly. Some some sources say that he didn't. Uh, like his obituary <laughs> apparently claims him of driving the entire thing and finishing the thing. And so he's the champion of this race. He abandons the race in Wyoming so that he could sail to Paris. Not for this race. He wanted to sail to Paris so that he could race in the French Grand Prix, which took place in July. This was, uh, this was still a fairly winter time and he had to make sure that he got there, uh, in plenty of time. So, the flyer made it a plan for a bunch of their crew members to drive certain portions of the race. And the plan originally was for Roberts to meet back up with the car when they made it to Europe. So he got the uh, not not like hating on the guy, uh, but he basically uh, was there at the beginning, was seen driving out of New York City, got part of the way across America, abandoned to go race something else. And then planned to rejoin the team once they entered Europe, become the driver again, and then finish the race as the driver. Not doing any of the hard stuff in the middle. <laughs> he gets to like he gets to sleep in like a French chateau somewhere in the Alps uh, for a couple months if he wants, and then come back and pretend like he did all the work. Uh, but we'll get to we'll get to his actual out, the the actual outcome in a second. 
And so at this point, when when Roberts abandons the Thomas Flyer, uh, they had built a two state lead by the time they left Wyoming. The Italians and the Zeus to just reach Nebraska at this point. Uh, the De Dion was in Iowa, and allegedly they were they were <laughs> they couldn't move. They were waiting car parts. Uh, something broke on their car, and they were awaiting car parts to get to them so they could fix their car and continue the race. And the Protos and the Motoblog, the, the last two teams, had just entered Iowa at this point. And not too long after this, the Motoblanc had to quit the race. They were having a ton of mechanical trouble. They were, <laughs> they were attempting to... They were so far behind. Maybe they had nothing to lose. Maybe that was their thought process. They had nothing to lose. And they were making a plan, attempting to ship the car by railroad to San Francisco. Of course, trains had to come in here somehow, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and uh, so they got caught doing that. They had a bunch of mechanical trouble. They figured out that they couldn't cheat. I don't know. I, I don't know how uh, someone well, caught them. Uh, yeah, like y- you would think you would think with uh, with the lack of coverage and with the lack of supervision on this race, they could have gotten away with something, but they couldn't, allegedly. And they ended up quitting. And wow. so at this point in the race, four remain. How do you feel about everyone's chances? Uh, it feels like the Thomas Flyer is obviously he got a great opportunity to win this thing. Everybody else is struggling. The Dadion is uh, not doing well. Don't want to be in a situation where you don't have car parts. But it's 1908, so at any point, anybody could just be completely out of this for months at a time. Like, <laughs> you yep. could go... From last to first, obviously, uh, obviously, you're we got some folks trying to put cars on trains and jump ahead. And if nobody knows what you're doing, it's possible. Right? I mean, it's this is a, a race three quarters around the or the way around the world. Uh, there's not officials to watch the entire thing, so uh, you know you're relying on newspaper stories. But even then, you're out in the country. I mean. <laughs> not a lot, a lot of, of coverage rural, a lot of rural areas out there uh you mm-hmm. could get away with some stuff so i'm surprised i'm actually surprised no one had cheated to this point with the thomas flyer in wyoming i would have thought <laughs> the cheating would have begun somewhere around missouri uh but they have not <laughs> done that so or indiana i don't know wherever they went through but they haven't done that so good for them it gets a little shaky for the thomas flyer going forward and we'll get to that in a few minutes, but first, it's trivia. I need one oh, of those. Yeah. Uh, I need one of those uh, systems where we can play like sound clips and stuff so. yeah, on demand. Need, and yeah, yeah. So we, we need we'll work on that. We'll work on that. We need uh, we need some donations, folks. And we'll we'll get on that. Anyway, <laughs> your uh, your trivia question. Uh, you get ten. You're not going to need ten questions. You might not no. need any. I need zero. You might. I'm. I'm not joking. You might not. This is a. Let's this go. is a fairly simple question. We've done this before. Um, and I didn't. I said Christy Matthewson. So let's. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think. Okay, I'm not going to say that again. I didn't think. Mm. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we talked about the French Grand Prix. That was the but, topic of conversation. Uh, the driver of the Thomas Flyer abandoned his team to go drive in this race allegedly. Yes. Um, who? Oh, has man. the most wins at the French Grand Prix all time ever. So, so this is the thing about this is that uh, obviously France is the home of the the Grand Prix. Grand Prix, Prix. because it's the Grand Prix because <laughs> uh, that is just that is just French for the Grand Prize, <laughs> and this is what we decided to name the races. Um. The, the wild thing, though, is that while it is the home of this idea of, of Grand Prix racing, there ha- there's not always been a French Grand Prix. Like, uh, the F1 did not do it for a very long time before recently restarting it, and there are rumors that it will no longer be on the schedule uh, going forward. So, yep. um, it is a modern, even though we're talking about it in 1908, I think it's a modern name that has the most all time. Am I yeah. correct in this? Yeah. This person, um, I'll say this person is still alive. Okay. So, uh, so then it's, that helps. So then it's not a current driver, right? 
That's correct. He is not driving anymore. No. See, now I'm just I'm just doing this for fun. Uh, does, does he have an offspring that currently uh, races in F1? You would know that better than me. Okay. Yeah, it's, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's Michael Schumacher. No. Nope. Yes, it is. The I'm just kidding. Michael Schumacher. <laughs> it, it is Schumacher. Michael Schumacher. He holds eight. Uh, he holds eight French Grand Prix titles. Grand Prix. Uh, in second place, in second place is a Frenchman, though. Actually, Ooh, so that, that was surprising. Uh, who is is it? Uh, Prost is Alain Prost. Prost. Is he French? Alain yeah, Prost yeah, is French, yeah. and he has Alan, six. Yeah. Uh, there's only two. Uh, there's only two current drivers with more than one win. That's Lewis Hamilton, Lewis and Max Verstappen. And Max Verstappen. So look, I am great at this. I told you that one was. I told ah, you that one was cake. You grooved. I knew the answer immediately. I just wanted to play along. See, grooved it. Know. Let's go. Easy peasy, Not right? Christy Matthewson this time. Nope. Walter Johnson looking person. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah see that was easy that might yeah. that might have been your best one uh yeah easily that might have been no. your best one that was uh, that Didn't was an fit. underhanded uh that was an underhanded softball play and i smashed just, it just to get you back on just to get you back on track and then it's gonna make me feel good yeah you can forget it next i'm just kidding I, whatever we'll figure it out <laughs> anyway uh so in relation to the grand prix though um I looked. The, I looked, and uh, Montague Roberts, the the driver and abandoner of the Thomas Flyer, does not appear to have actually competed in the nineteen oh eight French Grand Prix. Uh, there was there was quite a list of uh, starters and finishers, and he was not one of them. So I don't know what happened, but uh, he just abandoned them. I don't know why. He could have gotten all the glory too. If he just yeah. stuck with his plan. Anyway, it's tough. So the Thomas Flyer reaches San Francisco in the third week of March. Now we are uh, what approximately forty-one days from the start of the race. It took them to drive from New York City to San Francisco. Man, forty-one days. It's like a three-day trip now, and it's yeah, uh, forty-one hours if you didn't stop. Like realistically. And now we're going for a month. Oh man, how a miserable over a month. must that have been? In the oh. winter, there's no cabs. There's no heat. I mean, you're you're out of your car all the time. The wind's in your face. That's a long winter. I love driving, but that would suck. Ooh, maybe that's <laughs> what we should do next. I'm down. So the Thomas Flyer reached San Francisco in 41 days, and they were 900 miles ahead of second place. That's a long time. So they shipped the car via Freightliner to Seattle and then to Alaska. And then the idea was to, sh- to to drive through Alaska and to Russia. Once they reached Alaska, though, the the winter is still terrible up there. Found really, really bad conditions. And the race committee decided that that team, the Thomas Flyer, had to return to Seattle and go across the Pacific from there. So it is the amazing so, race. So they went well out of their way. <laughs> They went well out of their way, ended up having to turn around just to come back through a city that they were already in. But once they got back to Seattle, they had issues with their visas. And so they had to sit in Seattle for weeks waiting on their visas so that they could get across the Pacific Ocean. They got a roadblock. Basically, yeah. Meanwhile, the other three teams went straight to Seattle and went straight on a boat to Russia. No issues. And so now the Thomas Flyer, leading the race, basically from New York to Seattle, is now in last due to circumstances, uh, basically because they were in first. <laughs> circumstances out of their control. Now, eventually, everyone does, does reach Asia. And the race committee did uh, right the ship, if you will. They gave the Flyer a 15-day allowance, meaning they gave them... A an ex an extra fifteen days to finish the race in the same amount of time. Okay. <laughs> Are we saying they gave them a fifteen day head start, or they're just going to deduct fifteen days when from day the basing time? Yeah, yeah. From like so, the everybody's day, still going to be on equal. Like we're going to leave at the same time. 
Because that's a big deal. 15 days and you still got to go all the way across. That's a long time, yeah. Russia and the rest of Europe. You're going to encounter different conditions. Yeah. No fault of your own. So I, okay, okay. So they're going to give them 15. They gave them 15 extra days to, uh, to reach Paris. And they would, if, if they reached on the 15th day at the exact same time, they would be tied. So, and if they reached Paris 14 days after the first place car, they would win the race. Essentially. So they had to, okay, okay. I see it. Okay. Yep. Now, not only, not only did the flyer team get a 15 day allowance, the protos team got a 15 day penalty for cheating. Why not? Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, they, I mean, they kind of had to make up days. Yeah. Just make up the number. I don't, yeah, it's very weird. Uh, but they, they, uh, so, so essentially, uh, more or less the, uh, the protos, Give it, getting a 15 day penalty and the flyer getting a 15 day allowance, they now have 30 days of extra time. Yeah. Give or take. We'll get there. We'll get there. But just remember this. Remember the time discrepancy. One of the crew members of the Zeus, Antonio Scof- Scarfoglio. Antonio Scarfoglio. That sounds right. He was a uh, he was a crew member of the Zeus, but he was also a journalist and a poet. And so he's along for the ride, just just writing everything down. He actually relayed to the race committee how bad the conditions in Russia were for the race. He reported that the Russian government reported to them, the Zeus and the crew, that they, quote, shall be met on the road by Chinese brigands, Manchurian Rogers, fever plague, pestilence, famine. To say nothing of the mud after three months of rain, mosquitoes as big as locusts, and other similar delights. That's what he reported to the race committee. <laughs> Doesn't that sound pleasant? Like is, That just makes you want to go do this right now. And this is the Russian government letting them know this. Like, the Russian government know. told the racers, like, you're about to go through just everything. Just so we're clear, you're going to face all kinds of terrible... Mm-hmm. <laughs> environment just hey, let you home know field, home field advantage is uh <laughs> no, this is nobody's home field but you know everybody's facing the same issues in this case mm-hmm. i guess right yep so um so at this point the the race committee basically halted everybody in russia let everybody catch up and then they were going to restart the race with everybody on on a similar starting line a meeting at, while they were all together took place called by the Dadion driver Saint Chaffre and he wanted to bring all the teams together and ask because there were no gas rations there were there were no gas available on the race course at this point and the the Dadion driver reported that there was no gas and that he would give his portion of gas that he had for his car to any team that would accept him as a crew member. Essentially, he ab- he would abandon the race, knowing his car w- wasn't going to win in any way. He was abandoning the race. He was going to join a team of a contender, and he would give them their gas ration if they took him. <laughs> uh, apparently, the Zeus team ended up with the gas, but uh, St. Chaffre was not allowed to join the team. And so someone <laughs> someone jacked him of his fuel, and didn't allow him to join the team. Turnabout. So he was stuck turnabout with his own fair team. play, man. He got he fired his mechanic uh part way through this mm-hmm. deal. So now uh people and then he's pleading trying. for mercy. No one wants to help. Yeah, him. nobody wants to be on your side. Nope. How very Don't French. Him. How very French. <laughs> Once again, leading up to their names, maybe. So <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> uh, we have French <laughs> listeners and we're very sorry. You are very good people. We love you. Best. So after this meeting and after the teams were allowed to continue, George Schuster emerged as the new driver for the flyer. Uh, He was the mechanic from the get go. He started in New York City with Roberts, uh, but he he apparently kept getting lost. He was determined to win as the driver, but he kept getting lost. Uh, He was taking wrong turns. He kept getting stuck in the mud, which then required repairs to be needed to the uh, to be done to the car. And so this set the Thomas Flyer back significantly. At this point, the Protos, um, they built a newfound lead all of a sudden because, again, the Flyer being potentially the strongest car, 
they kept getting lost. And so now they're behind. The Protoss is in the lead. And the Zeus ended up 3,000 miles behind the Thomas Flyer. Mm. They're so, they got so far behind. They're basically out of it. You can basically forget that they exist they at, at yeah. this point. Yeah. <laughs> so it's basically down to the Protoss, who barely made it across America, by the way, if we remember correctly. Yeah. And to... the Thomas Flyer team. Yeah. So on, so now I don't know why, but in all of the, all of the reporting and all of the articles that I found, there wasn't a lot of, of journalism and, and articles relating to the, the race itself that took place after the teams left America, other than this little bit. There was just not a lot of media coverage, I guess, mm-hmm. of the race at that point once they once they left America, and so those were the, that was the few major happenings I would assume because on July twenty sixth in nineteen oh eight the Protos arrived in Paris first twenty one thousand nine hundred and thirty three miles later. Wow. Now remember this. Now remember the date, July twenty sixth. That's my birthday. Happy yeah. birthday to me. Happy birthday. A hundred and some years early. <laughs> so, at, so at this point, the Protos is in Paris, and George Schuster and the Flyer were in Germany. So not not far, not far. Yeah. But you never know what might happen, right? I mean, cars break; these cars are breaking down and getting stuck, and all this stuff. Well, no one in Paris knew about the fifteen day penalty that the Protos received for their cheating. Or the 15-day allowance for the flyer. So when the Protos arrived in Paris, there were parties. People were people accepted them. They were crowned the winners because they won. They got there first. Uh, every, it was a big party. It was a big party in Paris. But that didn't last very long. On July 30th, just four days later, the flyer arrived in Paris. Now, this is an interesting uh, report that... I don't know who, I don't know how this made it so so far being true but it's but it's it's funny. When the flyer arrived in Paris, they were immediately approached by police. They were told that they were being arrested because they didn't have a headlight on their car. That's a little extra. Now, one <laughs> that's arrest. extra. That's one that one that is extra <laughs> by the police. That we're is 100% extra you. by the police. But how on earth did they make the 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 last Five months, five and a half months possible without a headlight, without any they, sort of, without anything. They only, they, hey, they drove during the day and they slept during the night. Let's go. They must have, but then the they. Summertime, they probably were making good time. I mean, honestly, that's yeah. a good 16 hours of light, maybe 15 at the, the least still at that point. So they probably got a lot of daylight, but also, yeah, like, dang, I don't know, man. If I'm traveling <laughs> through an area where we got. Chinese brigands, Manchurian Rogers, and <laughs> fever plague. I may want a headlight every now and then, uh, even at night. Right? Yeah. During the so, day, I'm gonna have that know. thing on so people can see me coming. I don't know. That was uh, yeah. So they they were basically threatened by arrest by the police. Uh, Americans that were in Paris approached, tried to help. Apparently, someone riding a bicycle was nearby. This bicycle had a headlight. Let's go. That person picked the bicycle up, sat it in the car next to George Schuster, and said, look, my car has a headlight now. You can't arrest me. And the police left them alone. (laughs) They attempted (laughs) home field advantage. They attempted home field advantage. They tried. Yeah. Maybe uh, Maybe that's it. Maybe they were like, you know what? Our French teams didn't make it, so we have to sabotage. I don't know fascinating anyway so i lost you for a second you were gone again oh no okay keep going sorry all right yeah it's storming here that's okay we're good i can hear it anyway we're almost done yeah so once the once the bike gets sat in the car and the americans reached paris on july 30th remember the time remember the day allowance and the day penalty they reached within that 30 days. They they reached Paris only four days after the Protos did, which means the Thomas Flyer team officially wins the 1908 New York to Paris race, although they did they arrived second. They followed all the rules. They didn't cheat. 
and there were no penalties. They were given an allowance for going, I don't know how far out of their way, which Several is times. Just, yeah. just crazy. The Zeus and the Italians eventually arrived in Paris two months later. <laughs> <laughs> they were two months after the other two teams. Now, wow. after, after partying in Paris, I can only imagine. Oh, sure. I don't know how they returned the car, but the Thomas Flyer itself returned to New York City a couple of weeks, just less than three weeks after they arrived in Paris. And it just, again, we're just thinking about the, thinking about the technology of the time and the infrastructure, the lack thereof at the time, and just how ridiculous of an accomplishment this is. This, is, this, is, this has been attempted again recently within the last 10 or 15 years. And they, the original one got caught up by visas. A few years later, they actually did it uh, with cars ranging from like a 1920s model, model A, I think, Ford. And then like a, some sort of souped all the way to a souped up uh, Chevy Corvette of some sort. They somehow made the race happen. They're trying to reenact it. Apparently, the driver of one of those cars in the 2011 version of this race was like the great grandson or the grandson of George Schuster. The wow. driver, the driver of the Thomas Flyer to reach Paris. So again, uh, Montague Roberts, never to be seen again, <laughs> as far as this race is concerned. But in terms of complete time taken, it's still the longest motorsport event ever held. No motorsporting event has ever lasted five and a half months from start to finish. It's a, th- th- again, this is just an un- this is just an incredible uh, accomplishment for everyone who finished. Uh, I think it'd be pretty fun. Uh, again, I, when uh, recording these episodes about historical events from the 1900s, if I had to go back in time, I might go there. Get to see Jim Thorpe. Get to see the Tour de France start. You get to watch this. It's pretty dope. I I want to see a a similar race of this kind for uh, two things. I want to see an electric vehicle race uh, that would mimic kind of mimic this one or uh, a race in which you can't change the oil in the car or something like that like you know these oil um companies do these commercials where they're like we've tested this oil in a lab and it can survive in the saharan desert for 185,000 miles and it's like okay so let's put this in a car and let's drive it around the world and see if it actually can or not. Okay. Uh, I think that would be cool either way. Uh, Cause you know, uh, electric vehicles are a new technology and there aren't charging stations everywhere. Right. So you'd have to get kind of creative with how to, to do that, but to prove that it could be done would be uh, something worth making. Um, it would promote electric vehicles anyway, but also, you know, just, make all companies put their mouth, their money where their mouth is and see if they can do it. I think either one would be cool. Obviously it's a ready made reality show as well. I oh, wouldn't yeah. take five and a half. Wouldn't take five and a half months, but there'd be drones following the cars around and camera crews <laughs> with them. And it would be the amazing race car version. That'd be uh, sick. And it, you could do it. I mean, you could with it, with enough, you know, planning ahead, obviously you could do it. And, um, Make the route, make the route go through all seven, not all seven. Don't want to go to Antarctica. Make the route go through the other six continents somehow. And uh, they load up, they load up entire F1 teams and cars in, uh, you know, crates and send them from place to place in a week. So I'm sure we could do that with this situation. I think it would be cool to do that. But also, yeah, like you said, to go back in time and, be able to be in New York or Paris for the beginning or end to see it, to know it was happening, to be able to have a party apparently three different times <laughs> for once for each arrival in Paris mm-hmm. would be cool. Um, I, it feels like, you know, you watch a race and people get lapped and, and that's yeah. always sad. This, this is worse because the, the Thomas Flyer <laughs> was back in New York City before the Zeus arrived in Paris. That's yeah. I didn't think about it that way, but yeah, they basically got lapped. <laughs> like we've had we've had the the win party, we've had the return home party. 
uh, and you still hadn't finished. That's We've pretty. That would be embarrassing. Yeah. You haven't finished. That's uh, not- yeah. They probably forgotten for not forgotten about the race, but yeah, they're he's like like George Schuster's back to being a mechanic at this point, and yeah. these guys are still fighting their way across Siberia. <laughs> you know, but they did it. No, so good for them. They well, you got to finish right. Like if you're if you're ever able in a sporting event or anything like that, you just don't quit. You no, can't finish. quit, especially yeah, after. I mean, they made it all the way across the U.S. and then over to over to uh, Asia. And uh, yeah, no matter how far behind you are, you are going to finish this race. Gotcha. That has to that has to be your mindset going into it, right? And I like the, the the electric car idea is really interesting because not only would it be putting the company the oil companies um, brands to the test, but it would also be it would be doing the same thing for electric vehicles mm-hmm. with uh, with like their their true uh life the battery life range what is the range? what is the what exact what actually is your range and it would take a stress, lot of planning yeah. and like being under that stress driving what i don't know 300 miles a day for Easy, how many yeah. days mm-hmm. that'd be a lot that would it Can't would be a like lot how what I actually is because that's i mean from an electrical they're, they're still new then that's that's a lot of questions right how, how do these things hold up like yeah What's going to break when it does break? How expensive is it? Like that would be, I would be interested in following that. Be crazy. Honestly, there, so. there is a, uh, there is some sort of passage that, uh, that people have tried that starts in Argentina and goes to Antarctica, like the tip of, Ana- uh, the tip of Alaska, not Antarctica. Uh, but you, you can drive all the way from Argentina all the way through South America, Central America and uh, North America, all the way up to Alaska. And then you just take your ship over to Russia, drive all, drive around Europe. Somehow you got to get over to Australia, but, uh, that would be the, yeah, that would be the you would, and same deal. Same deal. Just kind of ship back and forth, ship back. And then, mm-hmm. then yeah, once you're you at on, least do the six, once you hit, uh, Africa and Eurasia, you're on dry land all the way through that. So mm-hmm. that'd be wild. We should start. We, I think we have an idea. So like these French, the French newspaper that started the tour de France and the French newspaper that did this, Y'all, listeners, we need Our your help. Podcasts. We need Our. your help. I am here today. What's again? Request asking. <laughs> once again, <laughs> asking for you, asking for your help. Starting that, that would be wild, though. That would be really yeah. cool. Anyway, so that that was a cool instance. Um, there, there's tons of reporting out there on this. Lots of different stories and and act, actual details are up in the air like with anything else but we do our best to give you what we believe is the truth uh so so go ahead and like us everywhere facebook twitter follow us befriend us uh download download wherever you get your podcast uh if you got your if you got any cool ideas like keep keep giving them to us we love uh we love doing this stuff so send us what you got and we will we will go ahead and research it for you and of course, uh, make a fool of ourselves with trivia sometimes. Not today, though. Not today. Not today. But that's what you don't know about the New York to Paris race of 1908. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of What You Don't Know About Sports. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please leave us a review, five stars only, and hit that subscribe button wherever you listen. If you have a great sports story, we want to hear about it. You can connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WYDKAS Podcast, and on our YouTube channel at What You Don't Know About Sports Podcast. All episodes are written, recorded, and edited by us. Stay tuned for the next episode.